good afternoon and welcome to everyone. My name is Alicia Carter Fisher, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first of the IMA's 2018 public lecture series. May I invite you to stand for the national anthem. You may have your seats. Once again, it's a pleasure to have all of you join us for the first uh, public lecture series. It's one of the activities that the IMA is hosting to commemorate and celebrate its 40, year, 40 years of marine research and coastal conservation. I'd like to recognize our, our governor, Governor Gabadon, who is a a member of the board of directors, or the board of governors, as we call, call our board. Um, our director, Dr. Hamid Khan, our deputy director, Dr. Rahana Juman. And without further ado, I'll invite Dr. Khan to give you the official welcome remarks. Thank you, uh, Chair, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you to the first in a series of five public lecturers in commemoration of the IMA's 40th anniversary of celebrating its um, status here in Trinidad and Tobago as an institution of excellence. Many of you may know that the Institute of Marine Affairs was established under an act of parliament to conduct fundamental and applied research in coastal and marine matters and matters related to that. Its genesis started in 1976, and by 1978, the IMA was established with its home down at Chagaramas, where most of us now reside. Um, that provides some challenges. You would have witnessed my bit of tardiness this afternoon. And that was one of the challenges of getting from Chagramas to Port of Spain. Um, but without much further ado, we're here to talk about um, our public lecture series. And our first lecturer is, of course, one of our more famous alumni. He is uh, Derek Hudson. He spent quite a few years at the Institute of Marine Affairs uh, in the geology department and uh, was responsible for much of the the assessment of the geological processes in our marine and coastal environment. But like many of the other alumni, he sort of moved on. I'm not sure whether he moved on to better things, but he certainly <laughs> has moved on. I see another alumni, Hayden Romano, the CEO of the EMA, waving in the background saying, no, he did not move on to better things. But at this point, I'd like to welcome um, Mr. Derek Hudson, he is now the Vice President of Shell Global, and we hope to get certain benefits out of that alumni association with him later on. 
Uh, I myself, as you heard, I'm Ahmad Khan, the director of the IMA, um, was also an alumni before coming back home, as they say. And I'd also like to recognize all the other alumni in the audience, in particular Dr. Judith Gobin and Mr. Richard Hubbard. Our governor, Gabadon, was also an alumni. And in that vein, um, sorry, I'm not seeing very well. I'm, there's, a, there's a light in my eye. So you have to forgive me if I don't see many of the others. But the point I want to make is most of the people who passed through the IMA and who have went on always have this very strong affinity for the organization. And in some ways, they continue to support the organization all through as they have moved on. And on that note, I think it's time to welcome Mr. Hudson to the uh, podium or turn it back over to the chair. Thank you, Dr. Khan. Uh, Dr. Juman, our, our deputy director, will just give you a little bio sketch of who exactly is Mr. Derek Hudson. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. So the first lecture, as you know, is Mr. Um, distinguished speaker is Mr. Derek Hudson. He is the vice president and country chair of Shell Trinidad and Tobago. He's a geologist by profession and has worked in the oil and gas industry for almost three decades. He joined BG, British Gas Group, in 1995 and previously held roles of vice president of one of BG's UK upstream businesses from 2000 to 2004, chief of staff in Trinidad and Tobago from 2005 to 2007, president and asset general manager of BG Trinidad and Tobago from 2007 to 2012 and thereafter assumed a similar role for BG in East Africa. With the merger of Royal Dutch Shell and BG Group operations in February 2016, Mr. Hudson serves as Shell Vice President, Tanzania, followed by his current post in Trinidad and Tobago, where he is responsible for Shell business in country. Mr. Hudson is on the board of Scotiabank Trinidad and Tobago Limited and has also served on the boards of NGOs and other voluntary organizations. He performed the role of non-executive chairman of the Port Authority of Trinidad and Tobago from 2005 to 2010. And as previously mentioned, Mr. Hudson was a geologist at the Institute of Marine Affairs in the 1980s. With that said, I would like now to invite Mr. Hudson to come forward and present his talk. Thank you. Thank you all, and well, it seems like a university graduation this afternoon with the reference to alumni, and um, I must say it is an absolute pleasure to, to do this here this afternoon for the Institute of Marine Affairs and to see so many um, faces that I'm familiar with in what was already a critical part of the evolution of my professional career. So in, in kicking off, I said I want to Thank you all for this invitation to address you on this important occasion. It is, of course, particularly special for me. As the, um, mentioned before, the early days of my career was spent as a geologist in this um, fine institution. This was a natural fit for me. I, I came out of university, and of, of course, in those days, in the early days, it's a little bit now like the, um, in the, in the you know, 20, from about 2016 to now, where you know, we have challenges in the energy industry, oil prices were low. It was not easy at that time to find a job as a geologist, so it was quite fortunate that straight out of university I started there with the Institute of Marine Affairs. One of the interesting things, though, that I reflected on in preparing for this, and it's something that needs to be addressed as we go forward, and I'll say this up front, how much of the conversation today, where we're still trying to move ahead, were conversations that were taking place more than 30 years ago. And that is not really a good testimony to how parts of this industry has, has evolved. That, of course, um, reminds me that um, 
You know, the dear deputy director reminded me that I have been in the energy industry now for 30 years, so that um, suggests that um, it's been quite a while since I left the Institute of Marine Affairs. In fact, it was 1989, so um, Hayden and Paul, you all should not laugh. Because, <laughs> because I am reminding all of you of how we have moved on over, over the last couple of years, but it's good. So let me begin by congratulating the IMA on this important milestone of achieving 40 years. This achievement is in no doubt attribu attributable to the dedication of the leadership and staff of this esteemed organization. The foundation I received at the IMA was a key cornerstone in my career in the oil and gas sector. The appreciation I learned in creating a healthy coexistence between development and preservation, about the importance of research and decision making, about the critical role that collaboration plays, I use these in my job today on a daily basis. And it is on these themes that I would like to focus this evening. For the next 20 minutes or so, I'll spend just a little time defining the blue economy, just so there's some consistency in our perspective. An interesting sideline there is everybody who see comments about the blue economy, and it means different things to different people. I'll then share some of what Shell is doing around the world to manage our relationship with oceans and coasts. I'll then look at some of the emerging issues and challenges and then spend some time sharing what I consider as best practice in the way we all should manage these issues. We are connected to the oceans in a very special way. In fact, we are connected to water in a very special way. Um, we are connected to the oceans with every breath we take and with every drop we drink. Our planet depends on the vitality of the ocean to support and sustain it. As an energy producer working in the oceans, we as Shell have a responsibility to minimize our impact and prevent no harm to the environment, including the living things in the, in the oceans. Some examples of living and non-living resources include fisheries to marine biotechnology to energies, both hydrocarbons and renewables, social and economic goods and services, tourism, marine transport and security, coastal protection, and much more. But our ocean faces major threats. And just again as a sideline, in my time in East Africa, I met a very interesting gentleman there, a chap called Ali Mufariki, who runs an IT organization, quite successful. And he gave a TED talk, you must go and look at it if you ever have an opportunity, that the next serious wars globally will be as a result of the impact that we're doing to our oceans today and how we treat with available water for the various populations as they grow around the world. It's quite an interesting concept. And I spent quite a lot of time with Ali in Tanzania as I went through his theories as to how he sees the world developing over the next couple of years. But as I said, our ocean faces major threats, something that you all are quite accustomed to in your day-to-day -day deliberations. Global climate change, pollution, habitat destruction, invasive species, and a decrease in ocean fish stocks. It's quite a challenge today to find thriving coral reefs in the Caribbean area. And we all speak about what's happening now with the Great Barrier Reef and in other parts of, of the world. It's a continuous challenge. You know, there's a challenge around plastics and plastics in the ocean and what we have to do about it. And what are we as a global community really doing to address these challenges? In 2015, world leaders gathered at the UN to adopt 17 Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, to achieve several extraordinary things by 2030, end poverty, promote prosperity and well-being for all, and protect the planet. The SDGs set a course to achieve these objectives for people everywhere. Oceans is included as one of the goals, Sustainable Development Goal number 14. I guess we could argue that it should be Sustainable Development Goal number one. Private companies, including ourselves, are aligning with this effort, and we are exploring opportunities to expand commitments in the area. At the Ocean Conference held in June last year at the UN headquarters in New York, close to 1,400 voluntary commitments for concrete action to advance implementation of SDG 14 were made by governments, the United Nations itself, civil society, academia, the scientific community, and the private sector. These commitments, together with the conference outcome document, Our Ocean, Our Future, Call for Action, marks a global breakthrough on the part to sustainable management and conservation of our oceans, seas, and marine resources. So let's take a look at what the blue economy actually means. 
The simplest definition of the blue economy is the sustainable use of ocean resources for economic growth, improved livelihoods and jobs, and ocean ecosystem health. The potential of the blue economy can increase long-term benefits of the sustainable use of marine resources for small island developing states and coastal, or where you're in, especially for lesser developed countries. The concept seeks to promote economic growth, social inclusion, and the preservation or improvement of livelihoods, while at the same time ensuring environmental sustainability of the oceans and coastal areas. The blue economy has diverse components, including established traditional ocean industries such as fisheries, tourism, and marine, maritime transport, but also new and emerging activities such as offshore renewable energy, something that we are quite interested in, aquaculture, seabed act extractive activities, and marine biotechnology and bioprospecting. These are powerful global statistics that you are looking at there. The value of the ocean is said here to estimated to be 2.5 trillion per year, and an effort must be made to protect and harness this economy. Just to digress a bit, I remember many years ago when um, Lennox Baller became director of the Institute of Marine Affairs. And that was when, in my time at the Institute in the late 80s, and Lennox said at the time that as a nation, we stand on the seashore and we look inside. We don't look outwards to the sea. And it's a part, you know, when you speak for a long time about the economic diversification of Trinidad and Tobago and the progress that we have made in our coastal wa waters and marine areas is something that we really seriously need to look at as we advance this economy going forward and even from somebody who is in the energy sector today, Trinidad needs to diversify its economy and do so quite rapidly. But as I said before, these are powerful global statistics, and we are just literally just touching the surface with respect to how we can utilize this resource effectively. It requires collaboration and cooperation across industries, which is critical to the sustainability of our environment and the viability of those businesses and industries that rely on our seas and coasts for livelihood. Shell, as a part of the oil and gas industry, is meeting the challenge to utilize and integrate the role of science and traditional ecological knowledge into its operations in a shared effort for integrated management of the coastal zones. We are signatory to the UN Global Compact. We aim to conserve and sustainable use, use our oceans, seas, and marine resources for sustainable development. One stakeholder group, however, alone cannot support a healthy blue economy. Stakeholders must collaborate to extract the economic benefits from the ocean and manage the socio-ecological impacts to support a sustainable development. At Shell, we support strong cross-sectoral collaborations or partnerships that leverage and utilize integrative strengths of different groups to monitor and protect the oceans public-private partnerships that bring together all ocean users, from government to academia to NGOs and other public and private organizations, create sustainable opportunities for building and maintaining a robust blue economy. Diverse and comprehensive partnerships combine the assets and leadership in each sector in a common way to solve problems, such as boosting local and regional marine economies. Internationally, the role of the public sector is transforming, gov is transforming. Governments are increasingly looking to work together in public-private partnerships or even tripartite partnerships that bring together public, private, and civil societies. Such diverse and comprehensive partnerships combine the assets of each sector in a common effort to solve specific problems, such as to boost local and regional marine economies. A successful and sustainable blue economy will not be the work of any single entity. It can only be developed through collaboration across jurisdictions, geographies, and stakeholders. In the Caribbean, the only thing that, in a sense, would bind us together in a very efficient and productive manner used to be West Indies cricket. It doesn't do that so well these days, but it is amazing that the Caribbean ocean does that naturally. And yet still, as a group of nations, you know, with how many people, yeah, I can't remember the number of hand, but it's not that many, okay? 17 million, cannot collaborate in a way to effectively utilize our marine resources in an integrated fashion for the benefit of the Caribbean and all the various islands. In 
internationally, uh, sorry, Sustainability requires breaking down organizational barriers and establishing an atmosphere that welcomes cross-sectoral participation to exchange information and effectively communicate, which is what we require Caribbean nations to do. Sustainability also requires innovation. The oceans are interconnected, the Caribbean Sea is, and the challenges facing the oceans are global. Innovation and transformation in relationships, technology, and data collection will provide tools to respond to these challenges. Our oceans, our oceans face major threats, as I mentioned, including climate change, pollution, habitat degradation and destruction, invasive species and a decrease in ocean fish stocks. Understanding these challenges in order to mitigate them requires collecting data for sound decision making, a role that we can play very effectively. As we spoke about collaboration early, it is the responsibility of all ocean users and stakeholders to collaborate collectively in order to understand and address these threats. As a global energy company, the second largest in the world and soon to be the largest, working in the oceans, we work to be part of the solution. This is Shell's deep water evolution in the Gulf of Mexico. As technology grows and we move into deeper waters, the amount of oceans exponentially increases. We have actually just touched the surface with respect to energy exploration in our marine waters. As you can see from the graph shown here for the Gulf of Mexico, in Trinidad, most of our oil and gas discoveries are in less than 150 meters of water. When we installed the Poinsettia platform of the north coast of Trinidad back in about 2009, 2010, it was in about 200 meters of water and it was the deepest at that point in time. There are a few deeper right now. However, we are now drilling wells off the east coast of Trinidad between 15 and 1800 meters. So we now are starting to touch the deep water exploration, deep water sea exploration here in Trinidad and Tobago. We found a bit of gas in the deep water last year with our partners BHP. And do we see potential? We'll be drilling two, maybe three wells this year and next to look further at deep water gas here in Trinidad and Tobago. We will do that in a very responsible manner, but do I see an opportunity where we would see deep water gas developments here in Trinidad in the next five to 10 years? The answer is an absolute yes. And this we must do in proper collaboration with all the institutions, governments, NGOs, efficient communities, and all together to make this a success. Because just as we need the oceans, we also need the energy industry to develop. Each stakeholder involved in ocean monitoring brings with it a set of drivers and perspectives that I truly believe make the discussion richer and the output more sustainable. At Shell, while some of our drivers refer to mandatory requirements, whether these be external or internal to the organization, some of these are driven by our commitment to best practice and from our, from our recognition of the role we play in society. And Hayden Romano wouldn't mind if I just mentioned that our collaboration recently with the Environmental Management uh, Association has been exemplary in trying to do what is necessary to maintain the energy industry as we get evolve and get into parts of with older infrastructure while maintaining the integrity of the environment. It ends up, it, you know, it's as an example where many of the other regulatory agencies should try to follow. Looking at the wider Americas region, Shell has been working for the past five years to establish a number of unique public-private partnerships to collect joint ocean observations in the Gulf of Mexico. These have ranged from ROVs, remotely operated vessels, to study and development deep sea biodiversity. And I have a special experience there from Tanzania. And Dr. Gobin had the audacity to call me in Africa and say we need to do this in Trinidad. And it was great to see that we did it um, last year it was that at least it then came to pass. We leverage MetOcean equipment to expand our blue water knowledge and glide us to improve blue current forecasting and to improve tropical storm and hurricane intensity models. As an example, we monitor climate change in the Gulf of Mexico coral reef sanctuary. The research objective is to collect baseline data to understand and monitor the effects of climate change on coral reefs. We monitor ocean acidification with a real-time ocean observation with real-time data over long duration in high resolution. The study started in 2015 and will end next year. Rising levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide affect marine environments by decreasing seawater pH 
and this obviously has negative impacts on corals and reef habitats. We are also so about supporting the next generation. Historically, access to the deep ocean has been limited by the extraordinary physical challenges of exploring this extreme environment. All would remember the UN deep sea drilling project many years ago. It is high cost and has limited technological investments and not many people invest in it, though that has been changing recently. The 7 million Shell Ocean Discovery X Prize is a global competition challenging teams to advance deep sea technologies for autonomous, fast, and high resolution ocean exploration. The success of this prize will allow us to fully explore and map the ocean floor and uncover our planet's greatest wonder and resource for the benefit of humanity. The National Oceanographic and Atmos Atmospheric Administration One Million Bonus Prize will incentivize teams to develop technologies to detect the source of chemical and biological signals underwater. All of this is about capturing the impressive data that lies deep within our ocean and using this not just to help preserve this unique environment, but also about using the captured data to simulate improved decision making. I would like to share with you a couple of examples from my own professional career. When I worked in East Africa from 2012 to mid-2016, covering Tanzania, Kenya, and Madagascar, we did some special things in Tanzania by drilling a whole series of deep water wells, which were quite successful. Some of them were actually close to 2,500 meters in, in water depth. It was quite interesting. Um, Tanzania and Mozambique are conundrums compared to Trinidad. In Tanzania and Mozambique, we have discovered gas about four or five times what we have in Trinidad and today but we find it very difficult to find ways to monetize it. In the reverse, in Trinidad, we have to look for more gas, and if we find it, we know exactly what we would do with it. And hence, it, it is quite interesting that you go from one part of the world to the next, and, this, and the whole challenge reverses itself. But what we were able to do in Tanzania, and they have done so also in Mozambique, we, was, we started a drilling program, and we had relatively in, little in-depth understanding of the marine environment. So we took the opportunity there at the time. It is an important basin, and it had very prolific gas reserves. And in our business, in order to prove the actual existence of hydrocarbons, we had to drill a whole series of wells. We drilled about 16. We, of course, fulfilled all the mandatory internal and external legal and regulatory requirements. But in addition, we also embarked on a collaborative research program to document um, previously unseen species of and flora and fauna in the depths of the ocean, Indian Ocean. We worked then, and I met him, with a chap called Andrew Gates of an organization called Serpent, Scientific and Environmental RDV Partnership Using Existing Industrial Technology, as well with other organizations who all work closely with our environmental team on several wells. And as a result, we developed a database on the fauna to depths of 2,000 meters below the the ocean surface in that part of the Indian Ocean. The study allowed us to learn a great deal more about life in one of the least known environments on our planet, information which is now shared for research and other purposes. This was truly a collaborative effort across different sectors of society to produce an important piece of research that has a life long and will live long actually after our drilling program ended. Here in Trinidad and Tobago, of course, we partnered with you, the IMA, on your commemorative coffee table publication, Coastal Reflection, celebrating 40 years of excellence, 1978 to 2018. And I will say this, as I say to all organizations that we reach out to, we're not doing you a favor. This is something that we must do as a force for good here in Trinidad and Tobago. So do we do what we do so we, you, you can afford to do what you need to do. Congratulations on this great achievement. Recently, as well, in collaboration with Nehurst, the University of the West Indies, and the Caribbean Council for Science and Technology, we contributed to a project called Deep Sea Wonders of the Caribbean. It was probably done more because of the nagging of Judy Gobin, but we were able to achieve it in the end. <laughs> this is an educational video and book series which aims to create a wider and deeper understanding and appreciation of the deep sea environment in the Caribbean. Prior to this, there was limited data on the deep sea in this region, and we are told that this series is the first high-quality videography and photograph photography of extensive areas at depths greater than about 1,000 meters. I'm pleased to show you now just a small part of this series.
Jacques Cousteau said that once the sea casts its spell on you, you are held in its net of wonder forever. The deep ocean is really one of our last frontiers on this planet. And in some ways, it's a wide open space and wide open for new discoveries. So I think it's one of the most exciting areas of study for young scientists to enter. I think there are many, many opportunities and needs. What was perhaps 20, 30 years ago rather an esoteric, poorly understood field of scientific research has now suddenly become extremely relevant. We have, for example, now even in the Caribbean Sea, we have exploration for oil and gas. We have these amazing discoveries. You know, when we're kids, we all want to be explorers at some point. We all want to be Indiana Jones. And it really hit home that this was a career in which I could do that for real. I could be a real life explorer. Have you ever thought of a career in deep sea exploration and science? There are a wide range of possibilities in this field that seem to grow wider every day. The Caribbean has traditionally been tied to the ocean in many ways. It is therefore important for us as Caribbean people to be a part of this wonderful adventure. So why not you? The young ones. Thank you. Another area of focus for us is our relationship with a key stakeholder in the blue economy, and that is our fishing organizations that operate on the coast nearest to our offshore platforms. We have began an association with these groups over the many years we have been operated here in Trinidad and Tobago, in recognition that we are both users of the marine environment. Both of us are making vital contributions to the economy and to society. We have always strived intensely to build our relationship with the fishing groups and their members based on mutual respect. We have not always agreed but it is important that our misalignment is managed with objectivity, professionalism, and based on a foundation of goodwill, delivering on our promises and so that we are able to reach consensus. I spent a lot of my time in the North Coast and East Coast speaking to fishing communities when we were drilling wells early in the North Coast in the late 90s and early 2000s before moving to the UK. It is not often a straight path to this consensus, but we remain committed to having an open door and in collaborating from a spirit of trust. We recently completed a seismic survey of the East Coast of Trinidad, one that I'm eagerly looking forward to for the results. But for this program, we began engagement with the fishing groups and independent fishermen very early in order to provide as much information as we could and for the fishing groups to air their concerns so that we could build mitigation actions into our development plans. We worked with the fishing groups and continue to work with a subset of this group on the traditional compensation mechanisms. But what really is of interest to me and excites me is the non-financial compensation on what we'll, on, in which we'll be collaborating. What exactly is non-financial compensation? In essence, financial compensation looks at the short term. Fishermen who fish in the areas where, where we are acquiring seismic are not able to for a temporary period and we compensate them. Using a scientific model, that's the way we do it for this temporary impact. Non-financial compensation, however, is focused on the longer term. How can we work together to improve and build a sustainable model of development for the fishery sector? We have done that on the east coast and north coast of Trinidad, and there are some ways to go. We have started it in Tobago. And interestingly enough, I went on a very um, unique trip a few months ago over just uh, uh, crammed into a few days to Dominica, um, Antigua, Barbuda, Anguilla, and Tortola, and it was simply to look at the hurricane damage and how we have helped. And we have committed to these communities in two main areas, the rebuilding of schools and fishing communities, because that's where it's a very good place to start. So we started that with Dominica, and um, Candice may swear at me if I say this, but we would like to extend that commitment to some of the other hurricane ravaged islands. In collaboration with the fishing groups in the East Coast and experts in the field, including Shell Global Resources and local and regional specialists, we'll develop together what this sustainable model should look like. Discussions have only just begun, and I'm look, really looking forward to what can be developed in this space. And I want to share a short with video with Shell you. Now investing um, with GOMFA, right, in a direction to diversify. 
I, not diversify away from fishing, but to enhance and to take it into a different direction. It's always important. I, and and um, the, the meetings and, and the, the setting down is important. I, we understand one another and I like the general approach where it's not a big boss, but it's that company, meet community for dialogue. Thank you very much. The idea to share this video was not really to pat ourselves on the back for the work we are doing in this area, but really just to stress, to demonstrate to you that the vision is there with our fishermen, the commitment is there, and it is up to all of us to harness this to make our fisheries sector a more important contributor to the economy. As I close, ladies and gentlemen, I want to leave you with my three thoughts on what I believe the future of the blue economy needs to look like. It must be transformative. Research and development must fill the gaps of our understanding. It must establish baseline, synthesize data, sustain observations. We must expand coastal and shelf monitoring into the less accessible blue and deep waters. We must shift from localized efforts to more expansive regional efforts. We must look at this not only from an island perspective, but from a Caribbean perspective. We must integrate and synthesize existing observation and data platforms and uptake these into decision-making. Our offshore platforms are there to be, that can be utilized as, measured, as facilities for different ocean measurements and should be used in that way. We must be innovative. We must not be afraid of new technology. I've seen the way technology has advanced in the energy industry and elsewhere, and the things that we could have done, we could not have done five, 10 years ago that we can do today and which will allow us to find more oil and gas here in Trinidad and Tobago in the foreseeable future. We must embrace new approaches to traditional observation campaigns and monitoring common ph phenomena. I spoke about the visit that we did to Dominica and those islands are completely ravaged for those of you. The pictures actually don't properly describe the story. And finally, we must collaborate. The increasing shrinkage of our world must be harnessed in order to leverage strengths between stakeholders that create opportunities to share data for public benefit. We must develop relationships to assimilate and analyze big data into consumable and useful products that all stakeholders from government to our community members can use. For instance, there are a number of opportunities to improve community understanding and monitoring of the oceans to mitigate potential and emerging threats. In the Caribbean region, we are not immune to the challenges that oceans around the world face. In fact, you can argue, and I've argued at several times, that the smaller the spatial area that you have to deal with, the more intensified is the impact that you have to deal with. What happens in the Pacific and the Atlantic will even be greater in the Caribbean. The issue of coexistence is a complex one, and managing this complexity is key in developing a long-term sustainable strategy to protecting and developing the blue economy. I was surprised that the blue economy actually only ranked seventh in global economies. I would have thought if actually harnessed properly, it could easily rank there with one of the top economies of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my view that we actually do not have a choice but to transform, innovate, and collaborate. The consequences of not doing so are too severe. In fact, the severity of it is seen as we live today. We saw the devastating impact of the 2017 hurricane season that it had on our neighbors. And one day, our shot will be called. We need to protect our future, and we need to do this together. Thank you very much for your time this afternoon. I must apologize that, I mean, I will take a, a few questions, but I do have to run to the airport tonight for the red-eye flight to Houston. Greg, are you going to harass me? Gary, are you going to harass me this afternoon? <laughs> Don't give me the butt, eh? <laughs> seem not to be aware of. Both of them are published in 2017, and both studies deal with the negative impact on zooplankton of the seismic surveys, the serious negative impact. Now, I am going to send you an email, if you'd be so kind as to 
share it with me privately, and I, I no, will no, send no, it. It's, it's so easy. I could share it with you publicly. It's derek.hudsonatshell.com. So send it for me. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Because there are two studies that show that the zooplankton are affected mm -hmm. and, are in fact, are killed, wiped out. Okay. And that substantiates what FFOs have been saying for 20 years on the collapse of the fishery immediately after and for several years um, following the seismic survey. So we, we have asked, and I'm sure you would agree, that there should be no harm in doing an analysis of what is no. there before the survey, during and after, which is what the EIA would embody. And the EIA seem not to be interested in the careful and hard look at the ocean. But based on everything you said today, I'm, I'm so am, happy. Today. I am, you send the information to me, and I commit that I'll have our folks look at it as we plan future surveys, because we will be doing more. We are here in Trinidad and Tobago to, to stay. Uh, we do see a very prosperous you know, business here in Trinidad, not only for us, but also for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And there's absolutely no interest on our part to do something that we think would be negligible to the environment, especially the marine Especially environment. since no one here knows that before you were the IMA, you were a star defender at St. Mary's College. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not too sure that Paul and they who played football with me would describe it that way, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. sure. um, does anybody else would like to ask a, a question? No? Okay, then. Well, I get the privilege to say thank you, Mr. Hudson. Your talk was quite informative and thought-provoking with regards to the blue economy and how important it is to our very existence. And to learn a lot about some of the initiatives Shell has been conducting around the world. Most importantly, I'm a strong believer that for us to achieve sustainable development and our sustainable development goals, we need to collaborate. And this is most important between sectors, regionally, locally, with civil society. This is what the IMA is promoting. So I guess we would be collaborating a lot closer with you in the near future. Um, with that said, I would like to now call my director to make a presentation to you on behalf of the Institute of Marine Affairs. So if you all don't mind, I, I will take my leave as I got to go and prepare for the airport. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. That brings us to the end the official end of our public lecture series, but I invite you to stay with us, have some coffee, have some tea, we have a few sandwiches, mingle, talk about what you have heard today, and stay tuned, we are gonna be having another public lecture series, June, June 8th is the tentative date, and we're gonna have Mr. Kishan Kumar Singh, who's gonna talk about climate change. So stay tuned, ladies and gentlemen, have a good evening. Thank mm -hmm. you.